Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and a very good but wet and cold afternoon to everyone. I hope everyone have had, have had a good lunch and um, I certainly hope that everyone will be able to stay awake throughout this very interesting uh, discussion that's going to happen soon. And I would like to welcome everyone back to Ballroom 1 for our Beyond Innovation Talk, of which for this talk we have four panellists which comprises of Dr. Vincent Ribier from Bangkok University. We have Professor Datuk Dr. Muhammad Amin Jalaluddin, who, which is the Vice Chancellor of University of Malaya. We have Dato Noharuddin bin Nordin, which is the former CEO Madrid Maida. We also have Mr. Muhammad Zarif Afandi, who is the director of TZI. To moderate this session, we have a very familiar face, which is uh, Ms. Lo Ngai Yuan, who is the president of Kakisini. But before I invite Ms. Lo up on stage, I would like to share a brief um, introduction. Not that you might need it, but I just want to share. Uh, a bit of information about Ms. Lo Ngai Yuan. Most recently, Yuan has been awarded Women Weekly's Great Women of Our Time in 2012 for the category of Media and Arts as well as Bella Creative Awards 2013 by the leading terrestrial TV station in the country for her contribution in the creative industry. Additionally, she championed the Tuka program, which is the program Transformasi Kedai Runjit both at the blueprint and execution phases as contribution to the ETP. In 2011, she was selected as the major subject expert for the Prime Minister's roundtable on engaging the youth and subsequently, she hates the performing arts pillar, mapping out the industry's growth for the data industry creative negara. She also conceptualized Women Girls, a platform to drive accomplished women as inspiration and role model to younger girls in a series of outreach initiatives and a mentor matching program. Earlier launch of this platform is awarded the best campaign of the year 2011 by the Malaysia PR Association. As you can see, Ms. Lo Ngai Yuan is not just a pretty face, she's a woman of substance as well. With that, let's give her a round of applause. Thank you very much. And obviously, because of my long introduction that you accorded me for, thank you so much. I then have a space, a huge space between the other guests because not knowing, oh, should we go on the stage now? So there was that silence bit. But let's solve that. Can we please have on the stage? We are very pleasured and very honoured to have on the stage Dr. Vincent Ribier, please. Prof. Dr. Dr. Muhammad Amin Jalaluddin, the VC of the University of Malaya. Dr. Noharuddin bin Nordin former CEO of Matrade and Maida, and a very good friend, Zarif Afandi, director and founder of this amazing platform that he's done. He's going to tell you about it in a short while. Please, gentlemen, I'm glad to be the Rose. So before we start on our session on what is beyond innovation, uh, talking about how innovation is supposed to change the very structure of a community and of our lives. Let's hear from Dr. Vincent a little bit about how and what he does uh, to encourage a lot more innovation at various different levels. Dr. Vincent is the Managing Director and Co-Founder of the Institute for Knowledge and Innovation in Southeast Asia, hosted by the Bangkok University. He's also an Associate Professor at Bangkok University's Graduate Business School. And the rest is about how he's founded so many different things. He does really, really exciting, interesting things. For example, he's the founder and animator of the iClub, which is the innovation and knowledge management club in Thailand, the founder and organizer of Creative Bangkok Week, also the founder of the Creative Mornings chapter in Bangkok, co-founder of the program director of the PhD program in knowledge and innovation management, KIM, founder and co-program director of the newly created master in business innovation. So we have a lot to learn. So Dr. Vincent, be my pleasure, please. Good 
Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. So it's quite Good a afternoon. pleasure. Ah. Quite a pleasure and quite an honor to be here with you today. I know it's a bit challenging to uh, be the first speaker after the, the lunch. Uh, we had a very great lunch, so uh, hopefully I will try to, to keep you awake. So uh, what I would like to share with you today is my vision a bit of what I believe uh, is after innovation or beyond innovation. And I will do it with some uh, illustrations that hopefully um, makes things kind of clear and, and uh, easy to, to understand. Uh, just rapidly to tell you rapidly a bit our institute. So we are based at Bangkok University. We do a lot of different activities uh, with Thai organization and Southeast Asian organization. And among the things we organize is an event which is called Creative Bangkok, which really brings people from the industry and academics together to share about creativity and how innovation can be fostered in organization. So I'm going to skip all of this. Um, so beyond innovation. So it's always difficult to, to forecast what's beyond something. And uh, so I will share a little bit with you what, I, what, I, what are my thoughts about this. But I think before even going over beyond innovation, it might be interesting to look what's before innovation and currently what is the status and how we got to where we are right now. So innovation is not always a positive thing, like for this card, for instance. Uh, innovation was not uh, a very positive thing, but in general, innovation brings a way to evolve societies and, and the way we work. So without spending too much time on this slide that you may have seen probably in, in different uh, other opportunities, so we move really from the uh, agricultural economy to the industrial age, and then from the industrial age to what we call the information age, where the information was the main uh, source of um, of operation and then we enter recently what we call the knowledge age now in this knowledge age the competition is a bit different from from before so in the agricultural age land was the main uh, source of wealth then in industrial labor the more people were working for you the more you were able to produce things then later on in the information age capital also became quite very important but in the knowledge age, what's more important is knowledge, and not only knowledge, but what we do with this knowledge. And innovation is directly driven for, from the use of knowledge. So that's what I will try to, to focus on today. Um, if we take the, the case of Malaysia, we can look also how this happened in Malaysia over time and how the shift happened over time. So I will not spend too much time on this. Now, we could look also at the, at the evolution of innovation, again, without getting into too much details, but there have been different waves of innovation, and we currently talk about the sixth wave of innovation. Again, each innovation somehow reflects to some, some economic eras. Again, it varies from country to countries. You can see that the waves are becoming faster and faster and shorter and shorter. And again, what's the next wave? I will not be able to tell you exactly what it is, but we have to be aware that there are these cycles that are happening and be prepared to, to address them. So one of the first stage of innovation is creativity. And so if we look back also on how creativity has been handled over time, uh, if we look at before the, the Renaissance, more or less, uh, it was a mystical and divine, uh, divine inspiration. So people thought that they were creative because of God or some kind of, of things that were somehow helping them to be creative. Now, in the 19th, 19th century, a lot of research has been conducted, but mainly in trying to understand why geniuses are geniuses, what, what, what makes them so smart or so different from others. But it was really focused on them. On the 20th century, this kind of approach extended a little bit more to not only on art, but also on sciences. And really at the late of, only at the late 20th century, we looked at how creativity, for instance, was nurtured or could be developed in the work environment. So it's not long ago. And then nowadays the evolution goes towards more collaborative source of creativity and innovation. And we see that also with what we call democratization of idea and social innovation. So there has been a shift of focus on, on uh, creativity and innovation being a single individual thing, 
by becoming something which is much more global and much more uh, networked. So a lot of studies look also at how ideas or where ideas come from, from entrepreneurs, for instance. This is one uh, study that was published in 2013 in the US. But if we just look at the main um, factor, 45% uh, of the idea come from replication or modification of an idea encountered through previous employment. So it means that a lot of ideas that people use or reuse are ideas that they have faced or that they have experienced in the past one way or another. So let's keep this in mind to get to where, uh, where I want to go next. Now, if we look at how organizations work in general, and all over the world more or less, People say, why are you not innovating? Why are you not creative? And people always say, well, we don't have time for it. Okay? So it means that there is something wrong here. We, we have opportunities to do things much faster, maybe much better, but people are somehow overloaded and, and, and they are not given the time to really innovate. So more or less, there is this cycle that we call the operational cycle, where people only improve when there is a problem. So when they face a problem, they try to find the root cause of the problem, and then they try to solve it. That's what we call incremental or continuous uh, kind of source of improvement. That's, that's good, but that's very limited in scope. If we really want to be innovative, we need to go to the next stage. So the idea is to moving, moving from the PDCA kind of cycle that you've probably all been aware of in, in quality, which is used a lot, to something that we call the Lambda cycle, which is quite new, that was released quite recently, and where we try to look at, at solve problem, we first spend a lot of time at looking really at what the problem is, spending time in understanding the problem, asking people around you the right question to understand it, then trying to model to prototype the, the problem, then discuss again the prototype with people, and then only at this stage to act. Okay? So it means that spending the time up front to really, really understand and emphasize and empathize with the problem before really, and, and, and going through small cycle of iteration. So again, these are some of the trends we are seeing currently. And there is this proverb that says slower is faster. That's a little bit of, of this, which is behind also this, this approach. So remember it, you will probably see it more often, the Lambda cycle nowadays. So what's behind innovation? So uh, that's what I've, the answer of what's behind innovation. I don't know. I have no, no clue. It's a black, uh, black scheme. No, I'm not going to leave you like this. So my vision is that that's what I call innovation, OK? With the term knowledge being really at the center of innovation. And I believe, based on what I mentioned before, creativity and innovation has been mainly centered on the individual aspect, a little bit more on the group aspect. But I believe that nowadays we need innovation to become much more systematic. And if we want innovation to become more systematic, it needs to rely on, on a structured way to innovate. And as you're going to see, the way we innovate is mainly based on knowledge that we previously acquired. So the idea going back to the operational cycle is how do you move from these routine things to something that brings more innovation? And again, I will give you a little bit of these answers today. There is a series of videos that have been uh, published. I don't know if some of you have seen them, but they are very, very good. It's called Everything is a Remix. And this series of videos shows really how every innovation somehow rely on past, on past knowledge. So innovation doesn't come out of the blue, out of a vacuum. It comes of previously acquired knowledge experience. And by combining them or recombining them together, and uh, somehow you can create something new out of it. So that's a concept that I like and I think uh, drives a lot of the innovation these days. So innovation, we are standing on the shoulder of giants. So it means that everything, most of the things that we do, more or less, are, come from previously uh, developed or acquired or knowledge. A couple of very good books that illustrate this concept. Art uh, Still Like an Artist. Uh, which is also a, a quite simple thing, but that shows that also most of the artists get their inspiration from other artists. Example, for instance, this Modrian painting that was the illustration of uh, Yves Saint Laurent dresses that became very, very popular in the past. 
another example how Google looking at the Microsoft logo and saying, okay, let's try and mix it and let's come up with something slightly different, okay? So there is maybe a bit of inspiration behind this. It's a little bit like dealing with um, uh, the, the table of periodical uh, elements. It's like you have different components, you have different pieces of knowledge. By selecting different pieces and you bring them together and you see a little bit what you get. Like you put hydrogen with oxygen, you get water. Okay, that's a little bit this concept. So how do you make this happen? Another example, everyone knows the Muppet Show? Yeah? Okay, everyone knows Sesame Street? Yes. So if you combine them, what do you get? Angry Bird. Okay? So it's as simple as this. Okay, and you can see, I mean, you can look at this. So again, by recombining things, and plus when you recombine, when you combine things that people are familiar with, they are even much more likely to adopt or accept <laughs> these new things because you realize on, on past uh, knowledge and past habits and so on. Being French, uh, the French croissant, uh, combined with the American donut, and you may have all known nowadays what we call the cronut, combination of croissant and donut. Again, very simple. I mean, the both components were available to everyone before. Only one uh, French baker kind of decided to combine them, and it became a big hit. And now the cronut is almost everywhere. So, knowledge is everywhere. Knowledge exists inside your organization. Not always codified, it's also in the head of your employees and, and so on. You have knowledge also which is external to your organization, to your competitors or, or available on the market. There are, of course, all the patents, but that's only one specific part of, of knowledge that exists. And you have also all this social knowledge nowadays, which is floating all around, and we talk a lot about big data and all of this approach to uh, collecting information and taking advantage of this or making sense out of this large amount of data to extract knowledge. So we believe that by taking this knowledge and trying to recombine it in a, in a different way, you have a kind of um, a, 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 a huge amount of possibilities for innovation just by uh, remanaging, remassaging, or remixing your knowledge through uh, looking at different angles. So why are we not systematically creative these days? Uh, it's mainly because of our brain. So our brain is, is, is a very, very powerful tool, right? So can you all read what's written here, even so half of it is, is hidden? Yes? What can you read? Be creative. Very good. So you all got it wrong. Okay? So I, I'm not cheating here, okay? It's, uh, it's okay? Again, the way our brain works is that it assumes a lot of things, as a lot of stereotypes, a lot of, of things that we are granted with. And until really you, you are able to go outside of this box, and again, looking at knowledge through different lens will help you to do that, will help you to somehow to, to innovate. So in summary, organizations, whatever they are, small, big, uh, needs to manage both sides, not of their brain, but more or less of their human capital, because that's where knowledge is located, exploiting the past, exploiting what is known, but also looking at the future, so exploring. Uh, but again, this exploration is mainly driven by what was known in the past. So again, I take back the example of Lego's brick. You bring up different brick of knowledge. You assemble them. You have different options to assemble them. Uh, you can assemble them in one way. It will look like a boat. Another way will look like a dinosaur or whatever. It's up to you how you assemble them, but at the end, you will get different things out of it. And that's what I'm trying to show here, that innovation is a process. Knowledge, more or less, is a content that you can use to innovate. And through this cycle, you are able not only to learn, but also to bring some value to whatever you're trying to do. And my last uh, picture will be, again, information is out there. You, everyone can grab it. Knowledge is not given to everyone, is how do you make sense of this information? How do you link this knowledge with each other to take action, to make action or to make decision? And what we're interested in is the next level, okay, is bringing creativity into it and innovation. So is how do you bring this knowledge together so we can bring something novel that can be of value to an organization? That's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. Thank you. There we have it. What happens before innovation can take place. But I do take a little offense yes, to please. that 
still like an artist. Okay. It, that's very discriminatory to artists. <laughs> Just because we collaborate and do it really well doesn't mean we steal. But I love that book. Very well written. Very well written. All right. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, can we please have Dato Noharuddin Nordin, the former CEO of Maida. And he was the chief executive officer um, at the Malaysian Investment Development Authority, um, which is the government advisory body for development and investment. And during his tenure at Maida, the economic transformation policy and new economic model was introduced in Malaysia which sought to change the image of Malaysia as a low-cost manufacturing country. The plan's aims are really to make Malaysia a high-income country by the year 2020 comes. So let's hear it from Dato Noharuddin. Thank you, Yuan. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizer for giving me the privilege of uh, participating in this conference. Uh, in the time allocated to me, I will use it to give you my take of this topic of beyond innovation. Uh, because of my previous background, as some of it has been stipulated by uh, UN, I'll be talking it in the context of uh, businesses, uh, in particular international business. Let me start by stating the obvious. It is a very competitive world out there. I think... Uh, uh, everybody knows about this, but uh, this is what Mr. Jack Welch has to say about competing. You don't have a competitive advantage, don't compete. Uh, competitive advantage comes in many forms. Uh, it can be the form of capital, it can be the form of a strong marketing network, strong distribution network, and many others. Uh, we can choose any form of competitive, competitive advantage to position ourselves in the market and depreciate ourselves. But uh, because of our topic today, I would like to argue that innovation and the uh, resulting uh, intellectual properties from the innovation is a very powerful tool for differentiating ourselves as a form of competitive advantage. But uh, I need to remind you that uh, innovation has to be done continuously because innovation can be both constructive as well as destructive, especially for incumbent. Those companies that have been already successful, you do not continuously innovate, change, evolve, in, uh, in tune with what's happening in the market, uh, they will be rendered obsolete by companies that are more innovative than them. So innovation is not just for new companies, innovation is also relevant for existing, especially uh, incumbent companies. But innovation itself is irrelevant. What is more important is it must deliver value to the targeted users. Here I emphasize two words, value and targeted users, because value means different things to different segments of society. So do not just think from your perspective that you, know, you are delivering value, but try to understand what the market wants, and the particular segment that you are targeting. And uh, in a free market economy, uh, I argue that uh, the best adjudicator of value is the market. Uh, because uh, if the market likes a particular innovation, it is willing to pay a premium for it. But I think we have observed there are many hundreds, thousands of innovation that have never seen the light of day because the market couldn't see the value in that innovation. So they're not interested in innovation, but if they like something, they're going to pay. Then the, queue, you know, the market is going to queue from, what, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning to get the latest products that have been introduced in the market. So taking the queue from there, my question to you is, what do you think of the market's perception of innovation from Malaysia? I'm not going to answer the question. You have to judge it yourself. Um, so, uh, in order to enhance value, I believe that we must engage market from the outset. We are often being burdened with issues of commercializing innovation. Why are we left with, the, with these issues? Uh, one of the reasons is because we don't engage the market from the beginning. If market
market is engaged from the beginning, commercialization is not an issue because what is being innovated is already enjoying the input from the market. But a lot of us, what we do is we come up with something creative, innovate, and then we try to sell it to the market. But uh, if the market, as I mentioned earlier, do not see the value in it, I'm sorry. Uh, you can uh, have all kinds of programs to promote the innovation, but there will be no takers. For innovative firms to succeed, there are three elements that is needed. First is knowledge, second is capital, and third is a customer base, a large customer base, not just a small customer base. In terms of knowledge, uh, the proliferation of knowledge requires a conducive infrastructure. Uh, I think this is something that has been debated a lot in the country. Uh, it needs, requires effective education system, a legal, regulatory, and judiciary framework that recognize and protect intellectual properties because innovation needs to be protected. And equally important is the competent enforcement of laws and contracts. Because even if you have the best laws in the world, but if you don't enforce it effectively, then it means nothing. Uh, if an environment that enjoys uh, these elements in the infrastructure, it will encourage uh, the people to take more risk. Uh, there will be more investment in innovation. Because uh, innovation requires substantial uh, investment in terms of money, in terms of time, in terms of effort. And uh, if it's not protected and the infrastructure is not there, then uh, the investments will not be justified. In terms of capital, I borrowed this uh, chart from the Malaysian Venture Capital Management Berhad. Uh, they use this to, to show the funding spectrum, but I'm using it for a different purpose. I'm trying to point out here where the real issue of access to capital is. Okay, on the uh, vertical axis of the chart, it shows the cash flow. On the horizontal axis, it shows the startup life cycle. As you can see, uh, at the beginning of a cycle, the number of companies and startups are huge. Uh, this is a hypothetical number. Uh, it can be more than this, uh, 500, but as you can see, Further to the right and further up the cycle, the number starts to dwindle. Uh, and finally, the number is extremely small. Okay, the point I want to emphasize here is that on the left side, among the 500, uh, the risk is high, the value is low. But what they have is that there are various government programs providing different, different forms of funding, including in Malaysia for startups. And those at the end, because they already have traction in the market, uh, they have already secured a position in the market and a track record, it's much easier for them to secure private funding. It is those in the middle here, in the middle box, that are having problems because they have been graduated from the government programs and yet they do not have a market share that will uh, gain the confidence of the uh, private fund managers. So this is the group of people that needs the most help, the people in the middle. Uh, I believe that some of the participants here are entrepreneurs themselves. For those you startups, you can go to the government and start asking, including MathCap, asking for all kinds of investment, funds, grants, whatever. But when you reach this stage, you're going to have a problem. This is true not just in Malaysia, but in many countries. And when you are very successful, the private fund managers will be more than willing to share uh, uh, investments uh, with you. So this is the area that needs the most help, but before we run to the government asking for government to come up with new programs to assist the group of companies, I would like to advocate that the private fund managers develop more sophisticated tools for them to assess this group of companies. Because if you are able to identify the, the, the strong prospects among this group, the returns can be quite substantial. Otherwise, the alternative scenario is that all the fund managers will be competing for investment opportunities among a very small number of companies. And uh, what will happen is that there will be over-evaluation, exaggeration of value, and at the end of the day, uh, these companies 
will lose and also the investors. So, and we'll miss out the opportunities offered by the companies in that box in the middle. And customer base. Okay, I do agree that when people say that before we go abroad, we should be a champion in the local market. There's nothing wrong with that. But as I mentioned earlier, innovation requires a lot of investment in terms of time, money, and effort. And uh, we have to accept the fact that relatively, Malaysia is a small market. You try to imagine the whole population of Malaysia is almost equal to the population of a single city in Indonesia, which is Jakarta. So with a small market base, not many people are willing to invest in innovation because the risk involved is extremely high. So we must have, we must be targeting a larger market base. And the only way to do that is to go beyond our borders. So I would like to uh, advocate that Malaysian companies from the beginning, from the earlier part of their life, to start looking at the market outside. And their innovation must be marketable not only in Malaysia, but also in the markets beyond our borders. And with the uh, ASEAN economic community being fully implemented by the end of this year, uh, it is a very relevant phenomenon for companies who are innovating and trying to reach at least the regional market. So uh, that's about all that I have to say, but as a final word, uh, innovation is a buzzword nowadays. Everybody, when they make their presentation, they will advocate companies to innovate, to be creative, uh, to undertake changes continuously. Uh, but remember, the market, if the market do not accept your innovation, it means short scenario saja lah. Okay? So, my advice to you all is that understand the market and when you undertake innovation, relate your innovation to the needs of the market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Datuk Nuharuddin. We appreciate a few points in there, very interesting, and which we'll come back and talk about, especially when it comes to uh, markets abroad, also about market size and also about innovation of value. So talking about innovation of value, what we are going to have next should be quite interesting because we are going to be talking about what the academics can be doing. Yes, exactly. So with us this afternoon, we have Professor Dr. Dr. Muhammad Amin. Uh, uh, he's just newly been in his position as Vice Chancellor since the 8th of November 2013. So well done, congratulations. He's um, obtained a fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeon Edinburgh in 1989 before. Was a fellow research fellow at Harvard Medical School in 1994. Fellow Academy of Medicine in June 96. June 2012 admitted as um, to Fellow of Academy of Science Malaysia. And as an academic, Professor Datuk Dr. Muhammad Amin contributed extensively in research uh, and he's published more than 70 journal papers, 36 conferences, seminars and other publications. He's been actively involved in many professional medicine com committees and currently the president of the Asia-Pacific Academic Consortium Public Health, vice president of the Asian Federation Laryngotomy, correct me if I'm wrong, Association, yeah, and honorary medical advice of the Spastic Children Association of Selangor Federal Territory. Amazing list of uh, resume. Can we please have you, Professor Dato? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Of all, of course, after lunch, heavy lunch, as the doctors worried about because why everybody fall asleep, but I can see everybody are tearful because all the blood circulation we go to gastrointestinal is not going to the brain, but because you are laugh, I mean, uh, laughing and respond to the speaker, Vincent and Dato, I'm sure that you are alert now because the circulation go back to the brain. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to talk about the Partnership for Innovation and Reaching Life, uh, Shaping the Future. This from the university, you know, because I'm from the academy. Uh, but I always cut the throat of people, you know. 
but not the Rafferty, uh, the, the issue of uh, raising up how to be innovative. Now, as an academic, always responded to uh, the blueprint, the 10 shift. One of the 10 shift is a uh, the shift seven that is a innovation ecosystem. That is strategy to drive innovation through the university. Of course, there's a lot in the books there, been documented well, but can we carry it out or not? Through the university, innovation drive entrepreneur, innovation drive commercialization. Well, as we see that sustained innovation, just now Vincent and Dato have mentioned about some uh, definition of our innovation, level of innovation, and that will talk about the market of the product, not point of have innovation, but there's no market, and then you then go to the market, and then it becomes uh, useless. Well, sustained innovation required the right leadership, structure, allocation, and resources. That will mention what resources just now. Now, the only thing is that we can see from uh, from the tri uh, triple helix to the quadruplex helix, where you can see the, the, the market and the expertise and also early stage of funding, I think is one of the components that we need to see. Now, building absorptive capacity for innovation through university engagement. Yes, university can provide a solution that be overcome major obstacles to prevent companies from acquiring innovation. Of course, many years ago, university professor just keep whatever they are finding in the drawer. They like themselves, they are only happen to themselves, and they forgot about the society. But of course, nowadays, research, if you from the research, calls for new innovation absorbed by the university and IP's accessibility. Then university go to design to have a latest technology, but talent development uh, can be customized on the engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, what the most important thing what UM have done, UM is, is doing now at the moment. We have uh, created a structure system of managing research output, intellectual property, and industry engagement. But of course, University of Malaya, for instance, is committed to translating its innovation are put to industry and the society. Now we learn a lot of things. For example, uh, end of the last year, 2014, we have a very bad flood at the east coast of Malaysia. And like a tsunami, you know, particularly in Kelantan, Gua Musang, and also the place where there is no water. When we talk to uh, I Kelantan, eh, uh, water Kelantan, apparently that not only to get, to recover, to deliver, particularly to remote area, it take another year. Another year for Iclantan to provide a good water, a high quality water to the population, to masyarakat. Now, what we do from lab, we bring up into, uh, into the society. Definitely, this is also a preparation, which the, our engineers had uh, do a lot of research on it. And in fact, we went to Tamalo where we take a flood water, filter it, and people can use it. Of course, it's not totally 100% high quality, what they say, they about bacteria. Eh? But this is one of the social innovation. Of course, uh, this is where happened. Uh, we, we give a 700 victim of flood uh, to have this filtration of water from the river. Then they can use that river water into cooking, into bathing, into whatever the utilization need water to be used, you know. Uh, of course, uh, here is a tube well. We, 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 we give to more than 100 schools in the East Coast, particularly in Kelantan, to have a proper clean, uh, clean water and quality of water. But the question here, um, this is uh, in fact what we call social innovation, innovation social, where we can give uh, like a corporate social responsibility, but we are not corporate people, we are the uh, university awam, but the question here, how, where we got the money? But we talk to the industry, we got to the donors, we got to, into, for example, from CIMB, Media Prima, and also a good 
uh, numbers of organizations giving the money to us in order to help to the society. This is a social innovation, isn't it? Because we provide a good quality of water, which they are, they are waiting for another year in order to recover the, the, the quality of water from Iceland. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the other thing is that we have a living labs. The living labs in the Ulu, uh, Ulu Gomba, where from turbine, we generated energy. Use a water turbine and generate energy, produce electricity. But we are working together with local authority in order to give another social innovation. That is to orang asli population around Gomba. Because uh, through this, we can supply the electricity so that orang asli can have enjoy the light, I mean the brightness in, in a night. This one way that Yunus Mulaya contributing into the society. Of course, uh, rain harvesting system. In Yunus Mulaya, from the last 10 years, we always have a problem of the water to the residential college. The student will, will bring up the more, I want water, I want water. Eh? But now we solve the problem by using the rainwater, rain harvesting system. The water is ample now in University of Malaya. Therefore, this, some of these situation we can help the nation in, in giving the, you know, our innovation into the country like Selangor, Kera, not enough insufficient of water. This is one of the solutions that the product can be innovated eh, to help the country. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, let me see that UM is engaged to the industry because UM cannot be just uh, the ivy tower, but it must work with the industry. Of course, innovation is a trademark for the MOSTI, Institute of Science and Technology. But the question here, university also wants to tumpang someone. <laughs> so that we can have work together. Eh? And definitely that which include here, uh, service and consultancy, knowledge transfer, solution provider, research collaboration, licenses, licensing, so on, joint venture agreement. But for UAM, we have more than 70 industries related to knowledge transfer, which we signed the agreement in 2014, but more now in 2015. Of course, we, as, we believe that providing accessible and supporting environment, environment for industry engagement. Yes, we have a center of what we call University of Malaya Commercial Industry Center, where take care of joint venture, I mean to the I mean joint venture to venture capitalists, uh, contract research, licensing, and also IP acquisition. Yes, we is more than 70 uh, our partners, academia, and then and industry partnership, and the more on this this screen can take, but there's more and in, more industry are with us now. Strategy support by excellent fundamental that we just always say. Just uh, take a break of uh, two minutes to say where you am now. You am is the top university in Malaysia. And in fact, uh, if you see the, uh, I mean the QS uh, in Asia, we are in 32 position last year and 151 position in the world. And of course, uh, we have a lot of students because of the innovation, there's a lot of students coming in all over the world to, to have elective in University of Malaya. That is uh, about 1,731 all over the world coming in. And our students also, we're not forgetting to have innovation outside to learn. Eh? 2,000 students from our cohort will go uh, to have elective outside the world. Of course, uh, in terms of citation impact, UM is the only one university who beyond the factors of one at the international level. Yes, I don't want to talk about UM now, we talk about the innovation. <laughs> now, we have a center of excellence. These are the center of excellence which are recognized by higher education, particularly UMPDEC, that's uh, Yung Simulaya Power Energy uh, Development Center, uh, an advanced center. And also we have Institute Ocean and Earth Sciences University of Malaya, where also recognized high COE. These are the two. But coming one, is NanoCAD in terms of uh, nanotechnology and t drag tropical disease. We are well established, known of a tropical diseases center. And also SIBA, uh, the Center of Research of Biotechnology and Agriculture. There's a lot of product coming out from that. 
we are not only in Malaysia, but uh, we can say that 577 institutions from 64 countries around the world. The thicker line is more heavy line where we are engaged with our partners. Of course, the dotted line, thinner line is less and less. But there's a lot of activities going on uh, on the, our research collaboration. We hope that this will help Malaysia particularly from one oldest university, then uh, we can be able to uh, reach outreach, particularly Asia Pacific, and also to the uh, Latin America increasing slowly and also to the Western country. Well, taking the lead in ASEAN Academic Entrepreneurial Network, innovation, I said just now, innovation drives entrepreneurial. Innovation drives commercialization. Therefore, uh, this year, 2015, ASEAN, Malaysia take the lead. We also, UN, want to play important role here uh, as an education, uh, in, as an university, uh, education led the ASEAN. And also at the same time, innovation, of course, from Ministry of Science, but we want to share together, work together, and can drive entrepreneurial in ASEAN and the region. University of Malaya, uh, techno, uh, we have a program called University of Malaya Technopreneur Program, supporting the creation of UM spin off companies, facilitating digitalization of UMIP to the industry. So far, we have 16 technology spin off from here. You can see we are related to the industry. New spin off company coming out Biobank Cell Culture Technology and also the Flat Fibers Optic Technology. These are the two coming up uh, into the, uh, the, the new spin off company from the University of Malaya. Pipeline product from spin off company like Optical Planner Splinter, Matcom, CBMKI. These are all from our researcher and academic staff. And uh, in fact, for example, CBMTI here is uh, creating, uh, is good for the neurosurgeon, ENT surgeon, all the medical field set up in order. It's being recognized by all over the world now in, 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 in US and in, in also in Europe. A lot, a lot of demand. Some other example, uh, important focus, commercialization also. Yes, innovation drive commercialization. Therefore, these are some other products uh, on the market now where University of Malaya engage parties. Yes, one more thing is that uh, we have one you know, product like which is lighting coming from turbine and uh, so solar and very cheap, this lamppost. And in fact, we have used this to assist the one, I mean, the DBKL, the install a DBKL bicycle lane project for Kuala Lumpur on the launch on the 14th, 14th of April this year. This is Eco green, green, green Wind Solar Hybrid Renewable Energy Outdoor Lighting System. Full scale prototype installation and campus. That's why it, 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 it becomes like a living lab in the university, but we extend into a city. Now, our mind, our, our, our arrangement to become a bigger in the, to the state of Malacca can utilize as a green as, uh, green country, I mean green city in the state of the Malacca. That is what in the future is coming up now. Creating space. Interaction with the industry always my creating the space for, so that catalyzing the innovation. This is very important. We have to create the space uh, for the researcher and create the space for innovation further to the one dynamic and also catalyzing the innovation indirectly. Yes, you, I mean, we have incubators. We start at the one level so that this current incubator in, in our, this building, RTPP building, 11 incubate, incubators, two partners, standard new idea space. But we are coming more, uh, the four story building for our incubator. This will be ready in the September 2015. Of course, coming soon, this Innovation Incubator Complex, University of Malaya, funded by EPU uh, for about 10 million ringgit. There's, ladies and gentlemen, there's more innovation for University of Malaya for the future, generating income, so that University of Malaya can be self-sustained with the UM Health Metropolis, 
yang UM University Malaya Medical Center Prima Teaching Hospital and University Research Park. Uh, they are coming out with the what we call UM Planet. That is a University Malaya Research Park. So the industry can come in more and work with the university. Of course, uh, we, we don't forget Ministry of Science. We have to work together. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, growing for a portfolio of IPR present opportunity for Malaysian industry, increasing demand from international market would like to accelerate transfer of technologies to industry as solution provider. Of course, we won't forget, university must engage industry, industry must engage university. I think this is innovation which can progress more. Would like to accelerate transfer technology and to industry as a solution provider and partnership for first in market proof of concept in Malaysia, looking to have more partners for development, test, bedding, marketing, uh, co-producing uptake technologies and last on the least would like to invite more venture uh, funding investment licensing partners of course in similar year always a partner with the ministry of science and technology thank you very much thank you very much prof at the last point we are all looking for the same partners as well venture capitalists we will be talking a little bit more about where we see that Unicity Malaya has been engaging a lot with the industry, but what about engaging with the market? I mean, after all, if we do want to have um, innovation that is of value, we will need to engage with the market. We'll talk about that shortly, but before that, let's welcome my very good friend, Zarif Effendi. Now, Zarif Effendi founded TZI, which is called the Zarif Initiative, and attributed its birth. Um, TZI, after he's volunteered for about a year in Aceh, Indonesia during the tsunami relief um, a couple of years ago. It is a freelance consultancy firm that specializes in self-development and community enhancement programs. Now, the firm runs using the community venture business model, where besides financial bottom lines, it operates only for socially responsible and sustainable initiatives. In other words, if you've never worked with TZI, you are you may want to question whether you are socially responsible, right? And um, he's a really well-awarded uh, young man. He's awarded the 2011 Padana Youth Award, Youth of the Year, Outstanding Achievement Award, Youth of the Year Award, so Social and Community Award 2006 by the Malaysian Ministry of Youth and Sports, member of the Malaysian Economic Transformation Program, Think Tank Committee for the Youth Development, also founding member of the Global Emergency Malaysia Humanitarian Relief and Head of International Relations of Gemma Nine Volunteers in Aceh. So, Zarif. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kanya. Assalamualaikum and a very good uh, afternoon. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to thank uh, the three speakers and also Mosti for inviting me. Um, I was thinking actually what am I actually going to be talking about today uh, in that because by profession as well, one of the things that I do in my company is that uh, we do personal development and um, in somewhat, I'm, I'm somewhat a professional speaker and I do public speaking. Um, but then on another note as well, I was just recently appointed about a year ago um, as CEO of, um, of, of uh, Gemilang Usahawan, uh, which is a new agency created under MTEM. So what I thought I wanted to share with you is a bit of a journey of who I am and what I do, uh, just a bit of short story on that, and essentially what my take on beyond innovation. So, oh, I don't have the... Clicker actually. The, the, the clicker thing. Someone is supposed to be. It's uh, back. All right. So before we go beyond the innovation, I thought I'd share with you something called the future of today, which is essentially looking at today, tomorrow, and yesterday. Um, so just as some of you might not know this based on because I'm wearing my jacket, I guess, um, is that, next, yeah. sweet. Good? Okay, cool. Go back, that's too fast. <laughs> All right, cool. Okay, so some of you might not know this, but um, I think one of the things that uh, has made me quite salient in what I do is the fact that I don't have hands. Uh, so I was born without hands, um, 
and uh, I went through the whole uh, life of you know, a, a child without arms and challenges. But I managed to go to school after that. Yeah. Um, went to school, uh, went to primary school, went to high school, all on a normal school. Uh, but one of the things that was very important to me as I grew up is that besides the challenges of, uh, of not having hands is that I was in a very enabling environment. One of the points why I want to share with you this life's journey is also because I understand that besides government agencies, besides private sectors, we've also got university students here. And I hope that by sharing my story as well, I would be able to inspire the university students and the young people here to believe in themselves and to innovate and know that they can be able to do some amazing things as well. So anyway, going back to this. So I went to school, uh, went to primary school, went to normal school. Then went to university after that. Uh, next. Yeah, went to university after that. Had a really good time. Uh, next. <laughs> yes, I was very fit back then as well. And I had a good, yeah, obviously I had a good time. And next. Uh, and essentially, despite all the limitations and all the challenges that I had to go through, I still managed to live a very fruitful life. Uh, you know, I, 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 I got education, I got to do all the passionate things, but I never ever s allowed the limitations that I have uh, to stop me. And I think one of the main things that I had to really live by was to innovate in my life. That means any limitations or anything that, because the world is all about, this world essentially is designed for people with hands. Uh, so I've had to really focus on getting to do things and learning to do things in a whole new way. Uh, next. So in that sense, yeah, um, I've also had some claim to fame, I suppose, in the work that I've done as well. So um, uh, as what Mayan shared, shared with you as well, uh, I've, I was awarded Youth of the Year maybe three or four times in the last seven years uh, because of all the work I've done in social innovation, in social impact, and uh, youth development. Thanks. So uh, yeah, recently I got a, a, a awarded, you know, a, a, I guess Malaysian Youth of the Year by the PM. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so a lot of the basis of the things that I've done is on social innovation which is essentially to create impact and change. Okay, now we can go into beyond innovation. All right. So beyond innovation, essentially, right? So what is beyond innovation? What was it all about? We've heard about before innovation. We've heard about you know, various uh, uh, going to markets, uh, 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 understanding the concepts of innovation. But to me, at least, in the process of my lifetime and in getting to where I am, uh, I've had to really systematically uh, 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 structure my process of thought. I think it came in a fairly organic way, uh, but as it maneuvered further, I think it created a fairly structured way on how I think. Next. So looking at, oh, okay, the margins are all different, but it's okay. Uh, looking at beyond innovation, I think I go through four main thought processes. Um, the first thought process is, of course, to understand the purpose of what we're doing. Secondly, is understanding the vision and seeing what we want to achieve. Uh, thirdly, is setting the motion in what needs to be done. And lastly, is what kind of impact do we want to create? Thanks. So let me, uh, let me uh, share with you the day I met Reason. <laughs> All right. So as a uh, as uh, uh, I had shared with you that you know a few years back, I um, I had a, an amazing experience and an opportunity that I got to go to Aceh to help out the tsunami victims there. Um, so initially, the story was that I actually went and registered with a bunch of NGOs, and nobody really wanted to send me there because you know they figured, what can this guy without hands do, except for maybe be a burden there. That's really what they thought, right? Um, and, but when I went there, I was, I was supposed to be there for a couple of weeks to help volunteer, but
but I ended up being there for about close to a year, almost 10 months actually, almost nine months, 10 months that I was there. And in my experience being there is when I found something huge. And that huge thing was purpose. So when we talk about innovation, essentially, what is innovation for if not to serve a purpose, right? I think innovations are worthless if they are not purposeful. And so I came to this realization when I was in Aceh that anything was possible with purpose. So as I was there, I got to experience a lot of amazing things. Uh, we went to distribute aid. We managed uh, the military's uh, uh, aid to the victims there. And I even built a few uh, uh, homes and schools there as well. So the day I met Reason was the day I felt that something was there to brew. And innovation, and in innovation, I think it's about brewing something for a purpose. Next. Secondly is on vision, seeing the unseen. Sometimes you have an idea, right? And sometimes this idea might work now, might not work now, might work tomorrow. Um, take for instance, so we, we had this project uh, about seven years ago, which actually started in the US. So I got, I got involved with this project called Rockcore Malaysia, Rockcore, which was to uh, uh, revolutionize how young people looked at volunteerism, right? So one of the premise that we had was that if we could make volunteerism look cool, right, in bringing in artists, in bringing in celebrities, right, and getting them to work together, while creating a value proposition of something that young people wanted, which was, for a lot of young people, music and entertainment. So what we did was we essentially created this platform that rewarded young people with concert tickets. So in that, you know, we managed to, to, to expand this project across the world, to US, UK, France, and Mexico, and in Malaysia, it evolved into something you might know now called I Am For You, right? which has been a largely huge project, right? So seeing the unseen is very important. But in this sense, when we first started that project, nobody understood what we were trying to do. Seriously, nobody understood. When we brought the project here to Malaysia, we were like, "How? what do you mean by making volunteering look cool? What do you mean by... by uh, 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 giving them what they want. But essentially, after maybe two years of pitching the project, it finally got traction. And now, I think volunteering has become far more engaging than it has been. Uh, yes, second, good, thanks. All right, so uh, motion to innovation or movement to make. So let me share with you what I mean by motion to make. Essentially, so you've got an idea, you've got a purpose, and you know, you've got a vision of what you want to do. But essentially, it's the motion that makes it and creates it. Um, I remember before the, days of, before the days of crowdfunding existed, we tried this little social experiment, uh, which was during the Aceh uh, period. So at that time, of course, nobody wanted to send me to, to Aceh, right? And uh, funny enough, we, we were trying to figure out how are we actually going to send ourselves there? We don't have enough money. Uh, we don't have enough resources. So what can we do? So what we did was basically we wrote an email. Back then, there was no Facebook. There was no uh, uh, Twitter. There was no Instagram. There was no social media. Or maybe there was Friendster. <laughs> there was Friendster back then. So what we did was we essentially wrote an email uh, or wrote a plan and then emailed it to all our friends and all our family members. And the most amazing thing happened is that within a week and a half, we started getting response uh, of that email. And within about two weeks, we managed to collect almost 10,000 US dollars, which enabled us to get our seed fund to go there and help out at Aceh. So the essential bit is that in order for you to start innovating is for you to start creating the motion. 
And in order for you to start creating motion, you have to start doing something first. So our first act was to be able to just share our idea, right? And with the platform that we have right now, I think it's become a lot more easier. Uh, next. And lastly, uh, impact. So beyond making, essentially, what we're looking at is impacting. Innovation probably means nothing if it doesn't create an impact or a purpose. Uh, so we're quite lucky in that. Next. In that with TZI, next. <laughs> yeah, with, that, with TZI, we've organized more than 100 community projects. We've had over 150,000 people volunteer with our projects you know, through all sorts of platforms. We've partnered with more than 50 NGOs and community groups and serve assistance to 7,000 individuals in need and gave over 100,000. I've personally given 100 motivational talks and inspired hopefully more than a couple of hundred thousand people. Um, so I believe that whatever limitations we have or whatever uh, challenges we have, we can innovate and we can, can create change. But I do believe that in doing what we do here, moving beyond just innovation, it's about creating that, that thought, that, that framework in your mind, essentially, of what needs to be done. So essentially, it's to create that purpose, right? It's to essentially uh, have a vision. And sometimes that vision might not be now, right? It could be tomorrow. But essentially, the last two is to create the motion and have an impact. So I guess that's my take on going beyond innovation. And uh, I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zarev. There we go. Four very celebrated and very different speakers have just shared um, their ideas of, uh, of various points in innovation. And uh, some before, uh, most touched on a little bit about a little bit about beyond. And right now is the time where we can practice a little bit of what you have to say too. So to respect the time a little bit more, we have approximately about 22 minutes left, thereabout. So it'll be good if you have a question, a burning one that you'd like to ask, please step up to the microphones that you find the right um, on your left and right, somewhere at the alley between your seats while we will continue with our conversation here on the stage. At any one point, when I see that there is someone standing at the microphone, I'm going to pause what we're discussing here, and we'll go to you. So at any point, if you have one, you can just be at the microphone. You're most welcome. And meanwhile, to all the wonderful panelists, we talked about um, innovation, we talked about various ways, and I think uh, Dato talked about how um, market access is really important. Um, Perhaps we want to be able to talk a little bit about that. In Prof slides, I think I don't see anything about um, uh, getting to the market, about how you are perhaps collaborating with the market forces to create programs or products for the market. So it's very much still at the industry, at, at engaging the industry. So how is that like? Yes, you'll be you, Prof. Now, yes. <laughs> uh, Yuan, I think that's why we are setting up our Unisim Layer uh, Commercialization and Innovation Center. From that itself, uh, responsibility look for the market. Uh, looking for the venture capitalists, industry, and... Customer base. There's a customer base. That's, this is the first step. We, we have done this. But beyond this, uh, we are looking more bigger aspect mm -hmm. where we, at the moment, for example, in Simlaya, we have more than a dozen products where we bring it together. And then, we, for example, uh, five years ago, I think the Chief Minister of Malacca wanted to build a green city. Okay, but still, it's not yet achieved. achieved. That will be approaching them. We have many products, more than a dozen that we try to work with them and whether this can be materialized, this, this innovation, to become a big green city in Malacca. Uh, ah, Malacca will be the first. This is a, a plan. A plan. Ah, okay. Uh, we, we, we are already starting talking too, but the most important, the vehicles that we wanted 
that innovation to be more explored to the market, we must have a, a, I mean, a mechanism, the structure, where not only the individual uh, base of, but we are thinking big more now, thinking bigger and bigger, and where we wanted uh, to bring all the researcher together, we are we, we we create a database in Unisim layer. Otherwise, I also don't know uh, who do who do and what they do, and what the product they coming out. Now with the database, uh, we can correlate. Okay, this product can be correlated to the product A to product B, and product C and product E. Then this product all can put it together, can be selling out, not only in Malaysia, but into the country like CMLB country. We need it. For example, if they needed lighting, we have good water. For example, I just give uh, our social innovation uh, during the flood, eh, big team, for the flood big team. That can be designed eh, further. further. Then if, uh, we can move to the market. For example, in uh, Laos, for example, we know that the, we, we study Laos, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, or what they need, you know. Uh, that's a market need, then we can bring our big force eh, uh, to extend to the ASEAN. Of course, uh, we, do, we should take care of the country needs first. <laughs> Which is the PPRN's whole, whole yeah, idea, that's right, whole idea between the private, the public research public, network. Yes, okay. yes, that's why in the blueprint of uh, education now, that being stressed. But of course, we have to work with the Ministry of Science also. Lah, because why <laughs> Ministry of Science only support university. <laughs> Okay. Eh, uh, research a grant. Sure. Also, big money is coming from Irpa grant last time. Now it's a uh, entrepreneur grant, a technocrat grant. I think that is very important. As Datuk mentioned just now, resources must be there. Eh, otherwise, we, we cannot force into the market. The product must be forced into the market, definitely. So, Datuk Noharudin, earlier when you said that the market base is. Ah, Sorry, just one more <laughs> before I go into that. I don't hurry in. Just now you were mentioning earlier about how the market base in Malaysia is small, which is about 29 to 30 million people, and that you are encouraging companies at the very beginning of their stages to actually look out and go outside. So are you actually saying that uh, uh, we should be looking at a market base of obviously a wider, a larger base? And how are we able to... To, to, to bridge this going out to the other countries because our needs are actually quite different from the other markets around the world. For example, the products that we are creating would be different. Exactly. Uh, I think uh, you got a point there because uh, the needs of our domestic market is different. Uh, before that, I want to go back a bit. When I mentioned about market, uh, I do it in certain contexts, it is a metaphor because in the case of Zarif, what he did in Aceh, for example, the market is the people who needs help in Aceh because of the tsunami. So it doesn't not necessarily a particular market in the literal context. So we must understand that whatever we do, there must be a market for it, and the market depends on, as I mentioned earlier, the segment that you are the targeting. users or customers right. most likely. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Going back to your questions, you see, if you were to develop or innovate, and then you are merely satisfying the needs of uh, the market or the users uh, in Malaysia and then uh, the next step is you try to adapt your product to the market outside it may not work uh, because you you yourself have mentioned that the needs of the market outside may be different so if you from the beginning you already have in international orientation then when you innovate you have that uh, sensitivity to the needs of the markets outside. So when you innovate, uh, your innovation can meet the needs of the domestic market plus of that. But in many instances, what we do is we stay out to our domestic market and then we try to sell the same thing. To, I try to push it to the other market. It won't work because uh, the needs and lifestyle, the culture, the context is all different. So we must be wary of that. And I also want to emphasize that here, uh, people all, often talk about domestic market, international market. I would like to argue that there is no such thing as domestic international market. Everyone has, needs to have an international orientation. Because even though you might be thinking that I'm just going to sell 
or market my innovation in the domestic market, your domestic market is not going to remain the same because you might not go want go to our neighboring countries, but they might come to your market. So you need how you need to know how to compete internationally, even though you are not going anywhere. You are just selling rounds to your neighborhood. So remember that eh, that international orientation is not exclusive to those who go beyond our borders. It needs uh, it's to, to stay be in exercise. competition. Uh, is to uh, ensure that we don't. If you don't out. go there, the competition will come to you. I agree. Right. We have the question earlier. Sorry, when I was swiping the room, I didn't see you. Now that no, I no, do. No problem. Yes, please. Yes, actually, okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is Urkifti. Just a short question regarding the link between market and innovation. So the, if it is as uh, Dato Noha mentioned, that uh, early engagement of the market to innovation is very important. Otherwise, uh, none of them take up this product or service. But uh, you see, innovation have, as far as I understand, they have four stages: idea, and you have to pilot, and you have to prototype. Then you have to do this uh, kind of upscaling, yeah. and when you engage with market, they always look at ROI. How confident is the market to what we have innovated? This is sometimes create a gap that market doesn't want because when they invest, company when they invest, they want ROI. See, so this is I think one of the main. Issue. So maybe Nato can have some comment on this topic. Okay, okay uh, innovation involves risk. I mentioned eh? risk underpins all innovation. Uh, I'm, I showed in the chart that out of the hundreds of companies coming out with innovation, that you know almost 90% of them will fail. Uh, but what we want to do is to mitigate that, to minimize the failure. And what University of Malaya is doing is exactly what needs to be done, but it may not be enough. They are working with the industries. So when we work with industries, the underlying assumption is that the industry is the one that engages with the market, not University of Malaya. So when you work with the industry, indirectly, you already have input from the market through the industries. So there are many ways of doing it, but for the smaller companies, this is the problem. Uh, some of the logos used by Prof just now, most of them are big com companies, yeah? some internationals, some multinationals, some local multinationals. Uh, but the question is, how do we assist the local smaller companies to engage with the market? So this is where we fail to provide inputs to those small. We just provide them capital, and then they come up with an innovation, and then uh, we come up with another program help them commercialize and try to get the market to to, uh, to buy it or to use it uh, but you know offer more often than not uh, the market will not absorb it because uh, there is no there is it is not fulfill a certain want of the market so uh, we have to think of this program and then you correctly mentioned about scaling up I totally agree with you most of our funding is for the startups but once they got something that has a little bit of traction in the market, they want to scale up, where do they go? I don't think there's any funds available to assist them. And the private sector market, equity market, is not ready to, to absorb them. So these are the things that we have to think. You know. Maybe it's not just funding that's actually needed. It's also support from the other points of like leadership uh, because their company is now in a completely different uh, space. They're looking at growth. They're looking at how do I, you know, scale? So that bit needs to be a complete different kind of support. Yeah. Getting so grants all the about time may not Beyond sustain. innovation, so you have to look in total in order for, you see, at the end of the day, does the innovation deliver value to humanity? If it doesn't, then forget about it. I think, I think there's another standpoint, if, you can, if I can add on this, is in terms of like reaching out to the market, right, or trying to position yourselves, Sometimes it's not just about having the capital to be able to reach out to the market. And likewise, like what I said, it's also about creating the purpose as well. But sometimes it's also about creating the perception. Uh, what I mean by this is that 
uh, I've I've found it quite useful, or you know, for 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 you to actually go out and position yourselves to be among big players, even though you might not be a big big player, right? So take for instance, um, you might have a new innovation, you might have a new company, you might have a new venture, or you might have a new idea, but if you go out there. And you you position it in a location, in a position, in a place via event, via an event, or via uh, 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 any programs, right? It might well create that perception of of a more um, of a more bigger mar bigger market access. Do you know what I mean? Uh, uh, like for instance, what we're trying to do right now in elevating the local brands in Malaysia. So one of the initiatives that we're doing right now is we're trying to elevate local brands to have bigger market access. So how we do this is that we're, we're creating a space uh, that is in a very big commercial area, like a big mall, right? So you put local brands side by side, shoulder to shoulder with big international brands, and you start changing people's perception and how people look at these local brands. So, so in a way, it's kind of like a strategy on how you would reach out more of the market, if you know what I mean. So lean in first and say that yes, we can do it. Yeah. What you say? Uh, I mean, I agree with um, sorry. Particularly for Malaysian, uh, if you're a local brand, brand, they say, "Ah, Pagala is Malaysian branding." Yeah, right. Yeah? It's not from Germany, not from Europe, you know, not from US. I think these are the issue that we have to tackle in Malaysia. Our product is not. I mean, that's why our oh, product is equally good, you know, or better than the which coming out from the European country, Western country. But unfortunately, our population mindset still said, oh, uh, made in Malaysia, why nothing? But I think the strategy that we should take is, so, I mean, uh, all level of uh, people must understand in order innovation to move forward for the Malaysian uh, innovation. Product. Yeah, so sometimes it's not necessarily the innovation itself, but how you present the innovation. Oh, well, I might think be... we just have to work a lot harder, really. Yeah. <laughs> I think changing mindsets really begin with the product or the idea itself. If it's good enough, it doesn't matter where it's made, personally. It can change the mindsets. I'm sorry, there's a question over there. Yes, Okay, please. thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ahmad Ibrahim, fellow Academy of Science, and also a young professor with University of Malaya. <laughs> Actually, since I have been standing here for 10 minutes, you must allow me 10 minutes. To no, say. it was not 10 minutes, sir. Yes, it was 10 minutes. I was first before Dr. Oh, Zou. Right. Oh, really? Anyway, okay. I'm actually very pleased with what the panelists have said. They are all very uh, true things about innovation because innovation is about delivering value to society. I think it's what Dr. Uh, because once society accepts it, then there is a market. You know, when society finds value in it, they'll buy it and they'll reuse it. That is what, and social innovation. I would like to go to Dr. Vincent's uh, presentation, which I'm very much attracted to, because innovation, we must remember, must start with knowledge. Strong knowledge base is very important. And he mentioned, Innovation is about combining different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of patents, different kinds of IPs to create a product or to create value. And he mentioned about remix. I think in terms of reaching out to the market, this is a very important concept because you come with something already familiar with the customers and it's very easy to commercialize. So in many countries like Germany or Taiwan, the universities must focus on knowledge generation. Do not burden the university with interacting with industry, finding business. They must focus on generating knowledge because that is the foundation of innovation. The applied research should be a separate entity. The universities can create applied research, but this is a different culture. Applied research and Fundamental research are different cultures altogether. And if you go to Germany, I'm actually also an advisor to Fraunhofer Institute, Germany. In Germany, Fraunhofer does applied research. And the uh, universities does uh, 
fundamental research, but they also have the Max Planck Institute, which look at very strategic, basic research. But they're all linked. All these are linked. Applied research are linked to universities. In fact, the director or the CEO of Ranhofer is a professor in the university. This is what we lack here. We don't have this linkage among research, among universities. We're all working on our own. So I'm glad in the 11th Malaysia plan, the prime minister has announced the establishment of the research management agency. This is a very good start where we bring together a network of research because today's problems, today's creativity, today's innovation require multidisciplines. We must have a cross disciplines of experts before we can really develop good innovative products. Thank you. So that was a comment, really. That was 10 minutes long. But thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> if you'd like to um, um, say anything about what he's just mentioned, uh, uh, Prof. Well, uh, I agree with Mr. Ran, because the most important thing is uh, multidiscipline. I mean, university cannot be isolated by themselves. The industry also cannot isolate themselves. Therefore, in order to come with the good output, of course, Sarah Tumray mentioned just now, in terms of fundamental research, yes, that is, is also very, very important. Otherwise, the, 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 to, to set up the fundamental in order to be applied set the next stage. But I think multidisciplinary is, is very important. Teamwork is very important. University cannot produce something which can, I mean, otherwise we just keep in the drawer for the, without commercialization. I think we need the industry to come and help the venture capital. Or, that's why it means by separation of the university work and the separation of the industry work. I think in the Rachanga Malaysia 11, 11 Malaysian plan, uh, putting uh, this uh, research management committee. I think that will oversee as an umbrella for the whole country. Hopefully, multidiscipline, teamwork, uh, university, academia, industry, uh, relationship should be enhanced. We're down to our last five minutes. Perhaps we'd like to end with some thoughts about your own thoughts about what's beyond innovation. Maybe Dr. Vincent. Reflect a bit on, on the question also that we asked. I mean, I believe that there is a need to involve the customer, whatever the customer is, much earlier in the process and all along the process. Not happening systematically currently. And the innovation cycle needs to be much shorter to be able to or succeed faster or to fail faster. And I think that's one of the solution is not going for a long process, which is takes a long time before knowing if the product, the idea or the process is going to be successful but to have much more iterative and short cycles that helps to kill an idea rapidly if we see that it has no hope to, to, to survive. And currently this happened maybe a little bit too late in the process and that's why maybe so many ideas or so many innovation projects fail because the customer is not involved all along and because uh, the cycles are too long by the time the product or the service is on the market, so the need of the customer has changed. So. There is a lot of, of this that needs to be uh, changed or evolved over time to be able to increase the success rate of innovation projects. Having that international orientation is something that stuck to me with um, Dr. Nohar's uh, uh, words earlier. Perhaps uh, any other further words on beyond innovation? I think, I think, I think, I hope we understand what Professor is saying about iteration. Uh, see, innovation is you try something, you fail, you learn from your mistakes. But the process cannot be too long. You, you, you make a mistake quickly, learn from the mistake quickly, make another mistake, learn the mistake quickly, and this iterative process has to be hastened so that the final lesson that we get from the iteration process is before the market, it becomes irrelevant Thanks. to the market. So this is something that we have to think about. Well, the people who are involved in innovation uh, the market is not waiting for us because someone else is working on the same thing. Yeah, but and which funding body would help us fail? Well, it's well a, allow that's, us that's to fail the, so many see, times. If you saw my chart just now, there's a lot of funding body. Right. But each one of us is working in isolation and yeah.
giving indicators, you know, announcing indicators which are irrelevant. I'm being critical here. Uh, we, we just, you know, short sendiri lah. You know, uh, at the end of the day, as I said, the adjudicator, because we are a free market economy, is the market. And the market here, I'm not saying just the market, you know, like supermarket and all that, but it's social market as well. So that's the final adjudicator of whether we are delivering value. And talking about branding, Branding is not advertisement, it's not announcement. To introduce a brand is very easy. You have a program, you book this hall, you have, you know, fantastic videos. But at the end of the day, the true value of the brand is the experience you have to deliver. You cannot cheat the market. You can cheat the market for a certain period through your fancy shows and all that. But after some time, when the market uses your product or your services, and you are not delivering the value you, you promise, the market will abandon you. That is branding. Don't forget that. Branding is not just about advertisement and all that. So at the end of the day, it's back to the fundamental of value and learning from our mistakes as quickly as possible. We must make mistakes. I agree with you. We don't mistake, we don't innovate. We don't do, we commit mistakes, we don't innovate. Thank you. Mistakes. <laughs> Let me say first. <laughs> no, I like that. It's like, yeah, make one. Would you? Yes, before we kind of wrap this. You know, we can't. Okay. Yeah, now, now it's good. It's good. Oh, now. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, I want to give a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Rahmat from University of Technology of Petronas. Um, I'm being critical here. Um, the topic, uh, uh, the title was Beyond Innovation, but what I heard was really impacts of innovation. I was really looking forward to hear analysts talk about how you sustain it. For example, when uh, Prof talked about how the perception of the quality of Malaysian products are is low, it's because of our failure to follow through with Beyond Innovation. We, I mean, we, we fail with after sales service, for example, relatively poor, and hence the perception. And I would like to touch on what Mr. Zari mentioned earlier. It's really perception. If you can actually manage trust perceptions in that your organization or your brand delivers yes. and then follows through and then hence organizations will believe the market will believe which leads me to my really main concern industries don't approach universities perhaps because they perceive our Malaysian universities to not be trustworthy in that they couldn't deliver because the perception is ala short sendiri paper je publish place evaluation then that is not true. Universities are in the business of generating ideas. We are not in the, in, in the business of implementing ideas. Industry must understand that. But However, we need to we, see it, maybe. Exactly. We need to and see enough examples, maybe. That's what we have, that's what we have downstairs in ITEX. <laughs> okay, that's what great. We, have downstairs. <laughs> we must all go see and then talk yeah. about it. Please, uh, please. So um, I do have a question specifically for Professor Weber. Uh, Dr. Weber. You're in the business school, essentially, and you've like number uh, this particular institute. How difficult is it to actually sell innovative management methods to companies, telling them, look, if you're going to innovate, this is a new management method that will enable you to manage trust, making sure that there's a knowledge transfer, especially for sticky tacit knowledge. How difficult or how easy is it to sell to ideas, especially in Thailand and Malaysia, because I'm finding it very difficult to sell to I that I those ideas to Malaysian companies. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so to answer your, your question, in fact, um, that's very interesting because, I mean, we are competing also with consulting companies, and, and, and for a lot of companies that work with us, they like, they, they like the fact that we have some theoretical background to back up our approach, and our technique, and I think that's more or less our advantage compared to the uh, to, to to the uh, consulting companies. And also, what the way we sell ourselves is that we're here to transfer our knowledge to your uh, to your team. So we are not here to sell you services forever. We want to transfer our know-how and our knowledge to your teams, to your innovation team. So later on, you don't need us any longer. We can still act as a coach, but that's how we we sell it. And I think they like this idea of. Uh, training the trainers or, 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 or sharing what we know and our approach and techniques so they can reuse them on their own later on. And I think that's, that's our selling point that seems to work pretty well uh, for our case in terms of innovation management and, 
and knowledge management and also showing them that what are the risks also of not doing it? What are the risks of not managing your knowledge? What are the risks of not innovating? Better than trying to sell, this is the advantage you will get by better managing your knowledge or this is the advantage you will get out of innovating. Because if it's, if it's perceived as an advantage or a nice things to have, it will never be on the priority list. If it's, shown, if it's shown as a risk of not doing it, then right away the tech is that, wow, we are, we are at risk here. We should do something about it. And that's how things get moved forward very often. Is it easy to make them easy? Is it listen. easy to for them to listen to you, to make them listen, listen to you? Well, I mean, usually we don't even have to approach them. They approach us. So uh, we, for word of mouth, usually it works pretty well. And all our projects have been quite successful. So it's it's we, we, we don't do any marketing. We don't have any brochure. We don't have any of this. We don't even need it. But uh, maybe at one point it might be needed or in other case it might be needed. But I think if you show that, you know what, that you're not a pure academic, but that you understand also their environment and, and their needs. and their world, then it's much Correct. easier. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I just give me a two minutes to comment. Two? One. Actually, one, <laughs> one minute. Okay. Uh, first thing is that, yes, you are right when about you want to talk about 10 to 15 years ago, that industry and university never talked together. But now, just today, lately, there's an improvement. Industry come to university and university go to industry. I think this is uh, quite more recent. This is because the industry are looking for the threat record. University have to prove the positive, good threat record in order industry to believe you. I think this is most important. That's, the other thing is that I just want to touch about short process. Uh, we have too many brokers. This is an issue that we should see back all the process, the procedure, allowing, uh, allowing it and approve it eh, should be shortened as possible. So that if we fail that innovation, we should wake up and then recover it immediately. But because of the bureaucratic, it stay longer and longer and the competitive world outside there, uh, we may lose the product. Oh dear, okay, I hope you're working on something to reduce all this bureaucracy. That's right. Uh -huh. yeah. Zarif. Yeah, actually, actually what Prof said totally resonated in, in that timing and what you do is very important as well. And in innovation, you, know, you might think that you've got a great idea, right? But the devil is in the details, in doing. And sometimes if you're slow in doing, then you fall behind. Because I, I can give an instance. Um, since I started working for, for Gamilang, uh, we've had numerous different uh, entrepreneurs come to us, right, uh, for good things and also to complain as well, right? Um, so one of the big things that we, we started realizing was that there are a number of, of, of great innovations that, that, that are coming out. They do get funded as well, but then the process of between them getting funding and actually getting the funding, right, is a very long time. And, and uh, uh, say if something takes eight, nine months to process, someone might just come up with exactly something similar, right? Uh, uh, and, and where is your innovation after that, right? Take your win. Yeah, right? <laughs> so there is a whole bureaucratic process that, that you know, needs to change. But then I think the, tr the, 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 the winds of the trends are starting to change as well. Uh, I think people are starting to realize this. People are also starting to realize universities do have a role to play as well in innovation. Industries are starting to engage as well. And you can start seeing a more openness and inclusiveness. Arts are getting more inclusiveness. Innovations in arts as well. Uh, a lifestyle is getting more, more, more attention as well. Technology, right? I mean, seven years ago, it was very difficult to start up to do a startup company, right? Absolutely. Right to do what an do app, work, right? What what yeah. what do you mean you want to do an app, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you mean you need funding for an app? What funds do you need, right? Isn't it just a computer and some buttons that you're pressing in there, right? So trends are changing and moving beyond innovation is impossible because innovation moves forward as, and so you know, what is beyond innovation in that sense, right? It's moving forward and so is innovation.
moving forward. And perhaps that is really the right words to actually end the session. The conversation about beyond innovation, what comes after innovation, will not end. It cannot end just after this afternoon. It must continue. And um, it's a really good question for us to not just ask ourselves, but it's also our own mindset, our own mentality, our own attitude towards a lot of stuff around us, not just reaction to the market or not just reaction to our needs, like the funding or uh, business needs. But it's also what is it that, um, that our products are doing, which is uh, innovation of value uh, and like you're saying, purposeful innovation. Uh, that's really doing I, to a larger picture. I think picture. instead of ROIs, people should start looking at ROOs. Which is? <laughs> Returns of objectives. Of, object, of objectives. <laughs> okay. Or goodness, or kindness, or wonder, or greatness. Thank you so much, sure. each and every one of you. I've really enjoyed myself. And uh, to each and every one of you, please remember that the conversation should not stop, should not stop here. It should continue. And you are really free to continue to pick up on whatever thoughts that you have with each of these panelists as they walk out of this room. Um, networking is really important. They do have a lot to share. Um, thank you so much for your time here. And we'll meet again. Thank you. Thank you, right, thank you so much, Yuan, for moderating the sessions and the panelists for sharing their thoughts, their ideas, and their experience on this topic. We hope that everyone here is inspired to do something that's beyond innovation. Now, to let's in, I would, uh, we would like to invite Yamu Bahage, Datuk Sri Dr. Nurul Ainur, up on stage to present a token of appreciation to our moderator as well as our panel list. First up, we would like to present a token of appreciation to Ms. Long Yuan as the moderator. Next, we would like to invite uh, Dr. Vincent Riviere. Next, please welcome Yamu Bahagi Dato Noor Harudin bin Nordin. <laughs> Next, let's invite Professor Dato, Dr. Muhammad Amin Jalaluddin. And finally, let's have Mr. Muhammad Zarif Afandi. Thank you so much, Amin Dato. And I would like to invite uh, Yamu Bahagia, Dato Sri, Dr. Noro Ainur, along with the speakers, to a holding room for some refreshments. The rest of the guests, please remain in the hall as we have one last special session for you. So please stay. <laughs>